the annals of history are filled with intriguing subjects. But perhaps one of the most fascinating is the story of the Bible Sabbath and its journey from creation to the 21st century. With this in mind, we begin today a Sabbath enrichment seminar that seeks to provide a deeper understanding of the topic. Our speaker is Dr. Samuel Bacchiochi, a well-known scholar who has a rather unique background. He was born in Rome, Italy, a stone throw away from the Vatican wall, and underneath the shadow of the Vatican, he spent the first 18 years of his life. Dr. Bacchiochi went on to attend Newbold College in England, where he earned a B.A. in theology, and then to Andrews University Theological Seminary, receiving both Master's and Bachelor's of Divinity degrees. Upon completing his seminary training, he and his wife Anna left for Ethiopia, where he served for five years as a Bible and history instructor at the Ethiopian Seventh-day Adventist College. In 1969, Dr. Bakioki returned to his native city of Rome to study at the Pontifical Gregorian University, the prestigious Jesuit university founded by Ignatius of Loyola in 1551. He was the first non-Catholic to be admitted to the Gregorian in over 450 years of its history. There he spent the next five years earning a doctorate in church history, which he received in the summer of 1974. He was awarded a gold medal donated by Pope Paul VI for attaining the academic distinction of summa cum laude. In his quest for spiritual discovery, Dr. Bakioki has authored 16 books and has contributed numerous articles to religious journals and magazines. For the past 25 years, he has traveled extensively, conducting seminars in many parts of the world. For the past 26 years, Dr. Bakioki has served as professor of theology and church history at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. He is married to Anna Gandin from Italy, and the two of them have three children, Loretta, Daniel, and Gianluca. In his first presentation, Dr. Bakioki shares the gripping story of God's providential leading in his life. This testimony has inspired thousands of people in many parts of the world, and no doubt it will thrill your hearts as well. Now here's Dr. Samuel Bakioki. Good evening, fellow believers and friends, and happy Sabbath to everyone. I would like to express my gratitude to the Fourth World First SDA Church for hosting this very special Sabbath enrichment seminar. I imagine that many of you have observed the Sabbath for many years, and you may be wondering, why do we need the Sabbath enrichment seminar? May I suggest two reasons? Number one, to enrich our understanding and the experience of the Sabbath. In my itinerant ministry around the world, I have discovered that there are some people that have accepted the Sabbath intellectually. They believe in the validity of the Sabbath, but they are not necessarily experiencing the benefits of the Sabbath. And I believe that if ever there was a time when we needed to experience the benefits of the Sabbath, such time is today. Why? We live in a tension-filled, stressful, restless society. Time magazine, for example, tells us that the best-selling drugs in America today, they are all tension, stress-related drugs. Indeed, people sometimes take pills, drugs, alcohol, vacation to a fantasy island, hoping to regain the peace, the rest, the balance, the equilibrium of their being. But experience tells us that inner peace and rest is to be found not through pills, not through places, but in the right relationship with the person. The person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who says, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Isn't it beautiful? And I believe that this is where the Sabbath comes in. God has given us the Sabbath so that we can allow our Savior to enrich our lives with this peace and rest. The second reason why I believe that we need a Sabbath enrichment seminar is to equip us to proclaim and to defend the Sabbath more fully. We are reminded of a statement in the pen of inspiration where it says that in this final hour of world history, the Sabbath is going to be proclaimed more fully. And in order to proclaim it more fully, we need to understand it more fully. We need to experience it more fully. And I hope that this weekend seminar will do it. Secondly, I believe that we need a Sabbath enrichment seminar to prepare ourselves to meet 
the various attacks against the Sabbath. You know, folks, the Sabbath is being attacked today like never before. By whom? By the Pope himself, who wants to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath. By Catholic and Protestant scholars who are trying to legitimize Sunday keeping as a biblical institution. It is also challenged by former Sabbatarian, as you are going to hear tomorrow afternoon. In fact, this is going to be the lecture at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, where we are going to discuss all of these various attacks against the Sabbath even by those who in the past were the champion of Sabbath keeping some of them are becoming some of the most bitter enemies the Sabbath and lastly the Sabbath is being attacked today by our materialistic culture we live in a culture where people have turned God's holy day into a holiday and this mentality is affecting even Sabbatarian in fact some Sabbatarian may go to church on Saturday morning, and then when they go back home, what do they do? They take off their Sabbath clothes, they put them in the closet, they close the closet, and they close the Sabbath. You know, they would observe the Sabbath as if it was Sunday keeping. You follow me? And I believe that this is the challenges that we are facing today, and this is why we need the Sabbath enrichment seminar. So let me give you an overview of this weekend seminar. I would like to start tonight with the first presentation where I will be sharing with you the story of the Sabbath in my life. It's entitled, My Search for the Sabbath at the Vatican University. I'm so excited that I can take you to Rome tonight and help you follow my pilgrimage of faith with beautiful pictures. You know, in the past I could only share my testimony with my broken accent and my Italian gesture. Now I even have nice picture I can use to help you visualize my pilgrimage of faith. The second presentation will be entitled The Sabbath as a Time of Service. We want to explore together how on and through the Sabbath we can serve God, ourselves, and others. The third presentation is entitled Divine Rest for human restlessness. This is the presentation where we are going to examine together how on and through the Sabbath we can experience in a special way the awareness of the presence, peace, and rest of Christ in our life. Now, the fourth presentation is a very informative lecture on the latest Sabbath Sunday development. It's entitled, The Sabbath Under Crossfire. You are going to learn how the Sabbath is being attacked today in an unprecedented way, and also how it's being rediscovered today by church leaders and religious organizations. I warn you that that is going to be my longest lecture. It's going to be two-hour session, but don't worry about it. You will see that the two are going to go by so fast and you look at the watch and you will say mamma mia it's already over I thought that brother Sam started just now when we get excited we don't worry about time and the final lecture is a very informative lecture on the discovery that I made in the Vatican archive on how the change came about from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity now if you are one of those with an inquisitive mind who really like to learn historical developments, this is going to be a very informative lecture. Believe me, it took me two years to do the research, and all several months to write it. And it takes me three months to teach it to my students. I'm going to give it to you in one hour. And what is nice, you don't have to pay tuition. My students have to pay $1,000 tuition. So I'm going to give you a $1,000 lecture free of charge in one hour. If you need college credit or university credit, let me know and I'll make a special arrangement for you. Okay? So I just wanted to give you a little overview of this uh, uh, weekend Sabbath seminar. And the last presentation, as I told you, will be dealing with the change from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity tonight. I'd like to share with you the, my search for the Sabbath at the Vatican University. I was born a stone throw from the Vatican wall, right against the entrance to the Vatican Museum, you know, just uh, across the street. And that is where I spent the first 18 years of my life. I remember spending 
my youth walking across St. Peter's Square on my way to school. And then with my friend, we love to go inside that beautiful cathedral, look at what is known as the throne of St. Peter with that impressive sunburst, you know. And then next to the throne of St. Peter, there is the actual statue of St. Peter, which, by the way, originally that was a statue of a pagan god, Jupiter. You know what they did? They put a, a crown on his head, a bunch of keys on his hand, and out of the father of the pagan gods, they made Peter, who for the Catholic is the founder of their church. And close to, and, and you can always see a procession of people waiting in line to kiss the toes of that statue. And they have done so much kissing that the toes are not there anymore. They have been worn out. Imagine how many have brought back with them souvenirs from Rome in terms of germs and viruses from the kissing of the toes. And close to the statue, as you can see, there is the famous altar designed by the great architect Bernini at the time of Renaissance. This is where the Pope celebrates the Mass on Sunday morning. Now, my father was a very devout Catholic. In fact, my mom and dad attended Sunday Mass regularly. They recited the rosary every night. They lived what you and I would call a very pious, religious Catholic life. Until one day, my father received the Bible from a Waldensian. You must have heard of the Waldenses. You know, the Waldenses have been known through the century for promoting the circulation and the distribution of the Bible. And this Waldensian gave a copy of the Bible to my father to read. Well, that Bible was a turning point in the life of my father. But before I tell you a little bit about the experience of my father, let me give you a bit of information about the Waldenses. This is the historical church up there in the north of Italy, near Torino, in Torre Pellice. This is the historical Waldensian church. And if you were to visit the church inside, you will see there is a Bible displayed at the foot of the pulpit. And on the top, that really explains the primacy of the Bible in the, in the mission of the Waldenses. Throughout the century, the Waldenses uh, dedicated themselves to translate, to copy, to distribute the Bible. And because of this, they were severely persecuted. Many times the Waldenses had to go hide themselves in what are known as the Piedmont Valleys, the Waldensian Valley. They lived in very rustic homes. Some of them are still surviving. And it was in that homes that they copied the portion of the Word of God. And then they, they, they distributed them as they went from house to house selling cloth. Many of them were merchants of cloth and in the bottom of their sack they had a portion of the Bible and they carry the sack around their neck. That's where we get the word colporteur. Colporteur means neck carrier. Colo, neck, porter, portare, to carry. They carry their sack around their neck and in the bottom of the sack they always had a little portion of the word of God. And when they saw a sincere person, you know, uh, they, they took a risk and they said, Madam, sir, you know, I have something special. I'd like to loan it to you. I cannot sell it to you. I can loan it to you. It's a portion of the gospel. I'd like to leave it to you for a couple of weeks. Would you read it? I'll come back and pick it up. And because of this work which they did, they were severely persecuted. Would you believe it? In 1655, thousands of them, it is estimated about 50,000 of them were slaughtered. By whom? By the papal army, the army army of the Duke of Savoy and many of these murdered Waldenses were dumped from this cliff. In fact, the name of the cliff is Castaluzzo, which means cast over. That is the place where many Waldenses were cast over down uh, the cliff because of the crime that they committed to translate the Word of God. And John Milton, the great English poet, dedicates a sonnet to them. He says, Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughter saints whose bones I scattered on the alpine mountain cold, even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all the father worshipped stocks and stones. My father joined the Waldensian church in Rome and well, for a couple of years until one Wednesday night. You know what? 
he, I was attending the Bible study on Wednesday night, and there were two students from the theological seminary, which is attached to the church. There was the building there is the theological seminary. There were two students giving a Bible study on the Sabbath Sunday question. One student was arguing for the continuity and perpetuity of the Sabbath. The other was asking, arguing for the legitimacy of Sunday observance. And what caught my father's attention was the text that was read by the one defending the Sabbath from Genesis chapter 2, 2 and 3, where he said, on the seventh day, God finished work which he had done. He rested on the seventh day. He blessed the seventh day. He hallowed the seventh day. When my father read this text, he went back home. He read it again and again. He said, well, what am I doing on the first day? And he read through the Old Testament, the New Testament, the more he read, and the deeper the conviction became that the seven-day Sabbath keeping was a biblical principle, valid and valuable for our Christian life today. What did he do? Well, he went through the city of Rome, looking for a seven-day Sabbath keeping church. But all the pastor with whom he spoke, all the priests that he uh, interrogated, they told him, there is no, there is no seven-day Sabbath keeping church in the city of Rome. Why? Because seven-day Sabbath keeping is Jewish. It was terminated by Christ, was nailed to the cross. You will never find the seven-day Sabbath keeping church in the city of Rome. Well, my parents did not become discouraged because somehow they felt within their heart that if it is taught by the scripture, it must be right. It must be true. And you know what they did? When they could not find the seven-day Sabbath keeping church in the city of Rome, they decided to honor the Savior by themselves in their own home. And this went on for about a year until one day, my mother received an invitation to attend the Bible study in the home of some friends. My father went along out of curiosity, and the gentleman living out in that Bible study was an Adventist pastor, Pastor Silo Agnello. And that was the first time that my parents were introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist church that consisted only of six members who met in a private home. We only had a nucleus of believers at that time. Today we have seven churches with about a thousand members. But that was the beginning of our work in the Church of Rome. And let me tell you, when my father and mother decided to become seven-day Sabbath keeper, the Sabbath became a testing truth in their life. My father lost a job. He was a builder working in building in a construction company. When he asked for the Sabbath tree, they fired him. And for the next six months, he was unemployed. In fact, every day he would go out looking for a job. And everybody had plenty of work because it was right after the Second World War. The whole city of Rome was being rebuilt after the bombing of the Nazis. It was not a matter of lack of work. But whenever my father asked for the Sabbath free, he would be shown the door. After six months, our family was starving. My father told me the story many, many times. How one morning he prayed to God the prayer of desperation. He said, dear Lord, to be faithful to thee. Our family is starving. We don't have a cent left. We have no food in the house. As I'm going out today, oh God, as I have done for the last six months, please, Lord. Touch the heart of a prospective employer that may give me a job so I can feed my family. And would you believe it? After that prayer of desperation, my father went out that morning as he had done for six months before. He went to the first building side and he asked the builder if he could use him. He explained his skills, his experience, and the man without hesitation said, yes, we can use you right away, change and get started. But my father hastened to explain that he would not be able to work on Saturday because it was his holy day in which he wanted to honor the Savior. All of a sudden, the builder became sarcastic. He said, Sir, did you come looking for a job or for vacation? If you are not interested to work, why don't you get out of this place? My father was a big man, bigger than me. He started crying like a baby. He said, Sir, I did not come looking for vacation. Everybody has treated me like you for the last six months. My family is starving. Please, give me a chance. I just want to honor my Savior on his holy day. Now, this man was surprised. Because in Italy, you know, Catholics are only culturally Catholic. 
95% of the Catholics only go to church three times in their life when they're hatched, matched, dispatched. Those are the three trips they make to church. And so to see my father, a big man, being so excited about honoring the Savior on the Sabbath, this builder didn't know what was going on, but he was surprised. My father said, sir, if you give me a chance, I'll work on Sunday, I'll work at night, I'll give up vacation time, I'll do anything that it takes to prove myself worthy. And that builder was touched. So, well, why don't you change and get started and let's see what happens. You know what happened? For the next 15 years, my father never lost a day of work. Apparently, the Lord was testing his faith, wasn't it? But, you know, the Sabbath also became a testing truth in my youth. You know, I had to face many challenges for Sabbath keeping. I had to face problems because Saturday was a school day. Some Adventist families sent their children to school because they did not want their children to suffer in their education. But my parents decided that we were going to be faithful to God and face the consequences. And I remember the principal of the secondary school telling my mom, my godly mother, who is still alive, by the way, I just spoke with her the other day. And she, uh, the, the principal told her that if I would be absent for three consecutive Saturday without medical excuse, I would be expelled. And you know what my mom did? She took me to the family doctor every week. And the doctor was very nice. He prepared the most funny medical excuse that you have ever seen. Saying, son, back you, on such and such a Saturday was psychologically incapacitated. What does it mean? Psychologically incapacitated. My mind was working fine during the week, but when Saturday came, it snapped out. It went out of order. I remember the Catholic priest that came to teach us Il Catechismo Catholico, the Catholic Catechism. Well, when he heard that I was there in the class, a non-Catholic Protestante, Protestante Adventista, Adventist, Protestant, the worst possible breed of Protestantism in the mind of the place. He told the whole class, Sam Bakyoki, sitting down there, is a Protestante heretical, heretical Protestant. Keep away from him. Keep away from him. And that's exactly what they did. You know what they did? Whenever I approached them to strike conversation, they would say, style on Tano. Keep away from us. Keep away from us. Tu sei un heretico. You are a heretic. Tu sei un judeo. You are a Jew. That's how they treated me. That hurted me. I was a teenager. Only 14, 15, 16 years of age. I used to go home crying like a baby. Mama, Papa, don't send me to school anymore. Everybody hates me at school. I don't want to go to school anymore. I remember my godly father looking me straight into my eyes. He says, Sam, you stand up for what you know to be God's truth. God will honor your commitment. <laughs> this is the challenge I like to pass on to all of us tonight. That if we stand up for what we know to be God's truth, God will honor our commitment. Yes, I had to face all this problem from uh, principal, priest, classmate, relatives who wanted to bring me back to the Catholic fold. And because of all of this ridicule and rejection and persecution, I started dreaming. While I was still a teenager, I started dreaming that someday, I said, if the Lord is going to give me the opportunity, I want to know which is God's holy day and what it should mean to our Christian life today. I felt that if I had to suffer, I wanted to be sure that I was suffering for the sake of biblical truth, not for the sake of a denominational tradition. Folks, let me tell you, my dream came true. My dream came true on July 1977 when I stood inside the Vatican Press watching my doctoral dissertation that was rolling off the Vatican Press with the official Vatican stem of the papal tiara and the cross keys and the official Catholic imprimato. Do you know this is the only book, the first and only book ever to be published by the Vatican with their official stamp of approval. And I hasten to say that this book has been a hot potato. 
it has generated far more controversy than you can imagine. Do you know what has happened? Many of the Catholic leaders in dominant Catholic countries of Central and South America have, uh, have uh, condemned the Gregorian at the university for allowing me to enter, study, research, and publish what they consider to be detrimental to the Catholic Church. This is a Catholic newspaper from Puerto Rico. If you open the newspaper inside in the center fold, you find the reproduction of the page of the imprimatur, which I have right here. And you know what they do? They are reproducing the page of the imprimatur, and basically what they are saying is that I have been a deceiver. I have been a wolf in sheep clothing. I have used deception to enter study, to have access to the archive, to find all the documents, and they believe that all what I did was through subtle deception. Folks, don't, that is totally untrue. Because as you are going to hear in a moment, it took months and months to process my application. I was also interviewed for two solid hours. They knew everything about me. So all of these allegations are totally untrue. And let me, let me answer a question now. By now, some of you may be thinking, Dr. Bakyoki, if you prefer, you can call me Brother Sam. Most people call me Brother Sam because Bakiyoki is a bit complicated. That's fine with me. Uh, you know Uncle Sam, so it's easy to remember Brother Sam. Bro Brother Sam, what made you decide to study there at the, at the Pontifical Gregorian University? After all, you are a Seventh-day Adventist. Why would you go to Rome? Why would you go to a Jesuit university to study? It's a legitimate question that deserves an answer. Let me answer the question by telling you a little bit, first of all, about the Gregorian. The Gregoriana is the leading Jesuit university in the world. It was founded by Ignatius Loyola, who is the founder of the Jesuit movement, has been the alma mater of all the Pope, Cardinal, and Bishop of the Catholic Church. To understand the Jesuit, you have to pay a visit to their church, which is next to the Gregoriana. It's called the Church of Jesus, that is the Jesuit Mother Church. I want to take you to the church, because this is going to be an interesting visit. It was built in 1580. As you can see, and when you visit this church and you look at the statuary of the church, you can understand the mission of the Jesuit movement. Let's begin from the outside. This is the facade of the church. There are two statues in those two niches. Look at one of them. This is the statue of Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit movement. You know what he's doing there? Shall I tell you what he's doing? He's trading underfoot a heretic. This is Ignatius of Loyola trying to suffocate a heretic by stamping upon it. What does that represent? That represents the mission of the Jesuit movement when they came into existence. They came into existence as a militant movement to suppress what at that time was Protestantism, that is the heretical movement of Protestantism. Now let's go inside. I want to show you inside. This is the main altar with the statue of Ignatius of Loyola and the sarcophagus below. And there is some very impressive telling statues on both sides of the altar. Let's look at one side. On the right side, you can see a woman treading underfoot. Two men. Who are they? Luther and Calvin. You can see the snake there, which encircled them to indicate that in their view, they are children of the devil. And who is the woman? The woman is the Catholic Church holding the torch of truth. And in the name of the cross, she's trying to suppress the work of these great reformers. And on a corner, you can see a little cherub there turning off the pages of Luther Bible. Let me give you a, a, a view of the same statue with a wider angle. It's a very, very impressive statue, isn't it? And I want to give you also a close-up view of the little cherub turning up the pages of Luther Bible because Luther committed in the mind of the Catholic the grievous sin of translating the Bible in the German vernacular language of the people and distributing it. Now, on the other side, there is another statue of a woman treading underfoot two pagan rulers, and that represents the mission of the Jesuit to bring not only Protestantism, but even pagans into the fold of the Catholic Church. Now I need to answer the question, why did I choose to go to study there? 
the answer is quite simple. I was dreaming. I told you before, I was dreaming that somehow, some days, God may give me the opportunity, you know, to, to research, to write, and to discover which is God's holy day and what it should mean for our Christian life today. And I thought that if the Lord would open the door for me to enter inside the Gregoriana, the most prestigious Jesuit university in the world, that I may have access to the Vatican archives where I was hoping to find documents, documents that help us understand how the change came about from Sabbath to Sunday. And I want to thank God for opening the door. You are going to hear in a moment that the door has opened, the door has closed. I was the first and the last non-Catholic to be admitted there. The reason is simple. The work that I have done has generated so much controversy, they don't want to take the risk again. Well, let me tell you that my admission there was not easy. There were a lot of problems because never before in 450 years they had accepted a non-Catholic. I was the first one. At the Second Vatican Council, the decision was made to... Um, allow non-Catholics, you know, in their pontifical university, and I was the first one to take advantage of it. And I tell you, they interrogated me for two solid hours. They wanted to find out if perchance I was an Adventist spy entering there at the Vatican to do subversive activity, when I reassured to them that I had no uh, conspiracy intention, no secret agenda. They finally accepted me on one condition. What was it? No proselytes. They told me that while I was there in their premises, I should keep my mouth shut. That's not easy for an Italian to do, by the way. I was not supposed to talk about my faith. I asked them, what if I am interrogated? Well, okay, if you are interrogated, you can speak, but only if you are interrogated. And you know what? I was interrogated all the time because I was an object of curiosity. One of the questions that they always ask me, to which religious order do you belong? Because all those priests and monks wore their monastic robes. I had no robe. I was only wearing layman's clothes a sweater, a pullover, you know, and so they said, Ma che ordine appartiene? To which religious order do you belong? And I would say, I belong to a special order, the Adventist order. Which monastic order is that, by the way? They have so many of them. And they were wondering if the Adventist order is one of the many. That gave me a marvelous opportunity to share my faith. You know, even in the classroom, many times we had a nice discussion. The professor would give a lecture on the historical development of one of the Catholic dogmas, and then he would turn to me, he says, Samuele, how do you Adventists relate to this? How do you conceptualize it? That gave me a marvelous opportunity to share my faith. I remember the day when we were discussing the, um, the anticipation of the first Sunday Mass to Saturday afternoon. Are you aware that the Catholic Church 30 years ago decided to offer the first Sunday Mass on Saturday afternoon? to accommodate those who cannot make it to church on Sunday. And the professor, after a lengthy discussion of this plan, which was soon implemented, said, Samuele, how do you feel about it? You Adventists must be happy. You must be jubilant at the thought that we Catholics are anticipating uh, the Sunday Mass the Saturday afternoon. It almost seems that we are becoming more and more like you <laughs> by observing the tail end of the Sabbath. How do you feel about it? The professor said, thank you for asking. I was only supposed to speak if I was interrogated. Thank you for asking. I said, you know, the Saturday, Saturday afternoon Mass may be good enough for Sabbath keeping, but not for Sunday. Uh, for, it may be good enough for Sunday keeping, but not Sabbath keeping. Why? Because the essence of Sabbath keeping is not just going to church, but giving priority to God in our thinking, in our living, during the 24 hours of the Sabbath. I told my professor and my classmates, everything that we do on the Sabbath, whether we participate in a corporate worship experience, whether we enjoy fellowship, recreation, all of it is an act of worship. Why? It springs out of a heart who has decided to honor God on his holy day. This leads me to the subject of my research. You know, I got to the school early one morning to find the parking spot. That little square that could only accommodate 150 cars was supposed to provide parking facility for 5,000 students. Can you believe it? You had to get to school two hours beforehand to get the parking slot. And I was there early, so I had some free time, and I started wandering around the hallway. Isn't it beautiful? I can take you inside. Isn't it nice? And this is the hallway of the Gregoriana. And I started looking at all the latest publications that had just been published 
And all, all the time they display the latest research of the Gregorian. And I notice a newly published dissertation, Storia della Domenica, History of Sunday, from the beginning to the 5th century. It had just been published in 1969, just the time when I arrived. And the author, Corrado Mosna, was a doctoral student, a Jesuit, who presented this dissertation. And I can tell you, I was rather surprised to read this dissertation. I was surprised because because Mosna, the author, argues that the Sabbath was changed to Sunday by the authority of Christ, by the authority of the Apostle, who he claims chose Sunday, the first day of the week, to honor the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this is a popular view. As you know, Catholic and Protestant have embraced this view that uh, Sunday it is an apostolic institution established by Christ and the Apostle to honor the resurrection of Jesus. But this is not the historical Catholic position. Historically, the Catholic Church has believed otherwise. For example, Thomas Aquinas, the greatest Catholic theologian, notice what he says. In the new law, the observance of the Lord's Day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath. What did he say? Not by virtue of the Sabbath commandment, but by the institution of the Church. You heard that before. Haven't you? Do you, you remember reading in the older Catholic catechism where the question is asked, why do we observe Sunday rather than Saturday? And what has been the answer? We observe Sunday rather than Saturday because the Roman Catholic Church, by virtue of her authority, has transferred the solemnity of the Sabbath to Sunday. You heard that before? So that has been the historical Catholic position. We, the Catholic Church, did it. Are you with me? Today, however, there's a new explanation. It's no longer the Catholic Church who did it, but it's Christ who did it. It's the Apostle who did it. It's the Bible that teaches it. Catholic and Protestant doctoral dissertation are trying to legitimize Sunday Observer. The Pope himself, you are going to hear that tomorrow afternoon. I devoted quite a bit of time in my book, The Sabbath and the Crossfire. I have 50 pages devoted to the Pope Pastoral Letter, Dies Domini, the Lord's Day, where he makes a passionate plea for a revival of Sunday keeping by making Sunday the biblical Sabbath. You are going to hear about it tomorrow afternoon. And even former Sabbatarian. In our own Adventist church in the last five years, we lost over 50 pastors and Bible teachers who have written books against the Sabbath, articles against the Sabbath. You're going to hear about it tomorrow afternoon. And they are also trying to legitimize Sunday observers. When I became aware of this development, a deep conviction be developed within my heart. I asked myself, is it possible that the dear Lord has brought me here at the Gregoriana at such a time as this to undertake a research conducted with scientific rigor and methodology, a research that can help to clarify the time, the place, the causes, the consequences of the change from Sabbath to Sunday in early Christianity. The more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the deeper the conviction became within my heart that I should go to see my professor. I remember the day when I went to see my professor, Vincenzo Monachino. I said, Professor, I have a special favor to ask you. What is it? Would you be willing to allow me to investigate the origin of Sunday observance for my doctoral dissertation? I hardly finished asking the question. Without saying a word, he went to his library and pulled out the copy of the very dissertation of Mosna, which he himself had directed. And he placed this under my nose and said, we have just published a major work on this subject, and it's not our policy to allow another student to work in an area which has been amply exhausted. You know, I've been a literature evangelist for 12 summers. I learned the important lesson, you never take the first no for an answer, otherwise you never make a sale. So I didn't take the no for an answer. I opened my briefcase, pulled out all the books I've been reading, including the dissertation of Mosna, of Rort, or for Daniel, all of these books. I professor, I read Mosna, I read Rordov, I read Danielu, I read Rega. My conviction is that the final word has not been spoken. If you were so gracious to allow me to re-examine all of this biblical and historical data, I believe that we can come much closer to the truth. Would you be willing to help him? When he noticed my conviction, my determination, he said, why don't you go down to the academic dean, take a petition blank, state your objective, I will recommend your proposal for approval. And that's what I did. And he was the man who directed my dissertation. And I tell you, I want to thank God 
for being able to work under such a godly man, a man with a high intellectual stature, a man that was willing to encourage the inquiry into truth rather than to protect the prevailing Catholic viewpoint. He was instrumental in helping me to get the imprimatur, the stamp of approval, but I'm sorry to have to tell you tonight that he has been suffering for it. He has been condemned, criticized, denounced. The general of the Jesuit order told him that he should never have to have a contact with me anymore. And I tell you, that has been hard because I was there in Rome a year ago. He was on his deathbed. I wanted to see him. They would not allow me to see him because of the instructions that were given. What was my strategy? My strategy was always to discuss historical, biblical document with my professor. Whenever I found something that was revealing, probing, uh, probative for the Sabbath, I went to show it to my professor, and I wanted to gain gradual approval. I didn't want to give him a knockout all at once. You follow me? Let me tell you, for example, one experience. One day I remember when I found a very interesting document of a Palestinian historian. His name is Epiphanius. He gives the whole history of the Jerusalem church. I was very interested to learn about the Jerusalem church because the prevailing assumption, you are going to hear it on Sunday morning, the prevailing assumption is that the Jerusalem church pioneered the abandonment of the Sabbath and the adoption of Sunday. And I found that this Palestinian historian gives the whole history of the church, how it left the city prior to the destruction of AD 70 in accordance to the warning given by Jesus. They went up to the north to a place called Pella. They established there. And you know what he says? That this direct descendant of the Jerusalem church insisted and persisted in the observance of the Sabbath of Mamma Mia. When I found that, I was very excited. I asked the monk on duty there, please, could you make a copy? Could you make a copy. I want to go and show it to my professor. He said, you know the rule. You leave it with me today. You get a copy of it tomorrow. But when you are excited, you don't want to wait for 24 hours. So I gave him a couple of thousand lire, about a dollar, you know, a kind of a tip. And I said, please accept this as a token expression of gratitude for your immediate service. And like in the creation story, it spoke and it came into existence. A minute later, I had the document, hot in content, hot out of the copy machine. I went to sit with my professor. He looked at it. It was in two columns. It was the Greek and Latin column. He read, first of all, the, the Latin and then the Greek. He said, what do I like from Where did you find this? It was right here, Professor. I did not bring it from America for sure. So said, well, you know what? This is the death blow to the theory that makes Jerusalem the um, birthplace of Sunday keeping. He got the point right away. If the direct descendant of the Jerusalem church insisted and persisted in observing the Sabbath until 350, until the middle of the 4th century, how could they have changed the Sabbath to Sunday in the first place? Are you with me? When I was able to prove to the satisfaction of my professor that Jerusalem was to be excluded, I continued my investigation and I found the real time, the real place, and this is the conclusion of my research, that the change from Sabbath to Sunday began approximately one century after the death of Jesus during the reign of the Roman Emperor Hadrian as a result of two major factors. One factor was anti-Judaism, which influenced the abandonment of the Sabbath. And the second factor was pagan sun worship, which influenced the adoption of Sunday. Let me give you a word of explanation about each one of them. What I discovered, folks, that in the year 135 AD, this Roman emperor, Hadrian, whose picture, whose bust appears on the cover of the biblical archaeology review that published my article as the cover story, this Roman emperor promulgated the most repressive anti-Jewish, anti-Sabbath legislation. He not only outlawed the practice of the Jewish religion, but even outlawed the observance of the Sabbath. Why? Because the Jewish people were uprising, rebelling everywhere. He suffered a lot of casualties in suppressing what is known as the Second Jewish War. And so he, he got tired. He said, this is it. Hitler said, let's liquidate the Jews. Hadrian said, let's liquidate Judaism as a religion. So he decided to, to suppress, to outlaw the Jewish religion, particularly seven-day Sabbath keeping. When I found that piece of information, that was a pivotal 
piece of information because I asked myself, how did the Christian respond, especially those in Rome, under the nose of the emperor? How did they respond when the Sabbath was proscribed, outlawed, forbidden by Roman law? Do you know what I found? I found that many Gentile Christians, in order to avoid the repressive anti-Jewish, anti-Sabbath legislation, followed the lead of the Bishop of Rome in changing the Sabbath to Sunday and also Passover to Easter Sunday on Sunday morning. Those of you that are ambitious, those of you that don't mind getting up early, those of you that don't mind opening your mind to new factual information, those of you that are really interested to grow, you come out, I'm going to tell you a lot of information that will make you a more intelligent, informed person. You know, I love to talk with people who know something. You know, sometimes I have to talk with people. Most of the time I have to talk with people. They don't know what they're talking about. I just listen just to be gracious to them. I say, I only wish they would take time to, to study a little bit because everybody's watching TV rather than opening a book. And that's why there are so very few people that are educated today because they don't have time to study. So time to make it out at least for a good lecture on Sunday morning. That will open your mind. Well, I found that indeed the, the motive for changing the Sabbath to Sunday was not a divine command, was expediency, the desire to avoid a repressive anti-Jewish, anti-Sabbath legislation. Folks, is expediency a legitimate motive for changing a divine command? Did Jesus ever say, hey, if you find it difficult to observe one of my commandments, don't suffer for it. Just change it. Have you ever read it in your Bible? Have you read it in your Bible? But I want to tell you something. I talk to you as a church historian. My PhD, my doctorate is on the history of Christianity. My specialty is the first five centuries. I taught church history for 36 years. So I talk to you as one who has spent time in this field. And I want you to know that time and again in the history of Christianity, many have chosen expediency, compromise, rather than commitment to the teaching of the Word of God. The second factor which influenced the adoption of Sunday was the influence of uh, sun worship. You know what I found? I found that the, the, the sun God became very important God, the most important God of the week. And the day of the sun, by the way, the days were pictured according to the planetary deity because each day was controlled by a planetary God. This was the picture of Sunday. The day of the sun was portrayed by the picture of the sun God. And you know what I found? That the day of the sun, which initially was day number two, followed by the day of Saturn, which we call Saturday, when the sun god became important, the most important god in the Roman pantheon, you know what happened? Even the day of the sun was advanced to the position of first and most important day of the week. And I found that this advancement of the day of the sun influenced Gentile Christians to adopt the sale of day of the sun. Why? Because by doing so, they could show separation, differentiation from the Jews, and identification with the Romans. They could be what we call today politically correct. You know what I mean? By following the majority without incurring the penalty that was reserved for the minority. Well, the implication of my research is that the change from Sabbath to Sunday was not just a change of names, was not just a change of number, but was a change of meaning, it was a change of authority, it was a change of experience. Indeed, it was a change from a holiday into a holiday. And I want you to know, folks, that this change has affected the quality of Christian living of millions of Christians through the ages. I'd like to share with you now the most dramatic moment of my experience, the defense of my dissertation. The date was Friday, June 14, 1969, almost uh, 32 years ago. But it's so fresh in my mind. It seems it was yesterday. I remember it was. We, the defense was held in what was called the Aula Magna, the Grand Hall, big, big hallway, decorated gold leaf seating, ceiling, baroque furniture. There was a small table in the main floor where I was sitting. All my fellow believers that came from all the churches to witness this occasion. On the platform there was a long examining table with five distinguished scholars. Examiner, all of them had a shining top like mine that added some luster to the occasion. Indeed, there was about 100 Adventists that came out on that Friday afternoon 
to witness an Adventist boy defending the Sabbath truth before such a distinguished team of Vatican scholars. I was, given, I was given one hour to give a summary of the methodology and the conclusion of my research. And in that one hour, I made a fervent appeal to rediscover the meaning and the blessing of the Sabbath in order to revitalize the quality of Christian living of millions of Christians throughout the world. Folks, I wish you would have been there. I wish you would have been there. I guarantee it would have been a memorable, unforgettable experience to hear my advisor, Professor Monachino. He's the one who directed the dissertation of my predecessor, Corrado Molsner. He's the one who directed my dissertation. And you know what he said that afternoon? He began by saying, after spending two years directing the dissertation of my previous students, Corrado Mosna, I thought we had established conclusively the apostolic origin of Sandim. But after spending two more years with Sandbach Yuki, directing his dissertation, and incidentally, he has written the foreword, the preface to both dissertations. After spending two more years with Sandbach Yuki, he said, I have to confess to you today that I have changed my mind. That I have come to realize, he said, that Sunday keeping, he said, is a post-apostolic phenomenon. What does it mean? It's a development that occurred after the period of the apostolic church as a result of an interplay of political, social, pagan factor, which San Bacchiotti has so eloquently explained to us today. That was sweet music to hear my professor, to hear that he had changed his mind, that he had come to realize that the Sabbath is a biblical apostolic institution, valid and valuable for our Christian life today. In fact, you know what he said? The very final word. After praising my work for 45 minutes, he closed by saying, and now, after all what Sam Bakyoki has said and done, there is one thing left for us to do. Oh, mommy, what is going to be? Is he going to excommunicate me now? I hope not. There is one thing left for us to do, and that is to wish the Sam a good, holy Sabbath day of rest. Mamma mia! I couldn't believe it to hear my professor wishing me a good, holy Sabbath day of rest at the end of the defense of my dissertation on a Friday afternoon, two hours before sunset. Ooh, I was ready to invite my professor to join with me in a joyful celebration of the Sabbath. I tell you, that was quite an experience. I will never forget it. Those words are still ringing in my ears. Having defended successfully my dissertation, I was able to receive a beautiful gold medal from the Pope himself. This was unthinkable for me. In fact, would you believe it? On the day when the medal were given, that was on a graduation exercise, I was not even there. You know why? I've been there before. It was such a long litany. It takes about four hours. And I was getting ready to come to America. I didn't know that I was packing. I didn't know that I had qualified for the gold. So I was packing that day rather than being there because usually they go on and, you know, they have all the eulogies of all the professors that have passed away the previous year. I mean, it goes on forever. I went once. That's enough. I said. But on that day, my name was called. No, I wasn't there. And when I went to get all my paper, one of my classmates said, Sam, where were you on the day of the graduation? Your name was called. The Pope was there to give you a medal. Don't tell me that. I rushed up to the academy. Is it true? Is it true that I... Yes, yes, you have been awarded this beautiful, nice big gold medal. Here is the picture of it, and you can see there too. He said, said where were you? We tried to get in touch with you. Well, I said, I moved. Well, because I gave them the original address, so I stayed there for a year, and then my father is a builder, helped me to build a little place outside the city, and that's where I was living. Well, he said, we want to have a little ceremony. And so a few days later, they had a little ceremony um, the, where they give me this very special medal and recognition. This is the front side of the medal showing the Pope, the year of his pontificate, the ninth year. And on the other side of the medal, there is a shepherd with, um, 
with the lamb on the shoulder, and there is the flock and the New Jerusalem. He portrays the Pope as the great shepherd of the flock, leading God's people to the city of God. Fellow believers and friends, I view this gold medal not as a personal triumph, but as the triumph of truth, the triumph of our mission today to proclaim the good news of the Sabbath to our tension-filled and restless society. I also received a very unusual diploma. This is the only one of its kind. Do you know why? I refuse to accept the first diploma. This is the picture with the original. It's four times larger. In the first diploma, the opening statement said that I had signed the Catholic profession of faith, which is not true. When I looked at it, this cannot be my diploma. I never signed your Catholic creed. One said the diploma is the same for everybody. We only have inserted your name. It cannot be the same for me. Because people will jump to the conclusion that while I was here, I recanted, renegated my faith. Don't worry about it. You go back to America. The America don't understand Latin. The diploma is in Latin. Why worry about it? No, I said, I'm not prepared to compromise. So they gave the assignment to a Vatican scribe to prepare this beautiful handwritten diploma. It's all written by hand, decorated by hand. They tailor-made the diploma to reflect my religious persuasion. And when I went to receive it, the dean, I want you to, he said, I want you to know that this is the nicest diploma that the Vatican has ever produced. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And when I received the gold medal and the special diploma, I was reminded of my father's word. who used to tell me, Sam, you stand up for what you know to be God's truth. God will honor your commitment. And I also received an unusual regalia. Uh, this is a beautiful regalia. In fact, the whole stem of the Gregoriana is embroidered in gold. And if you have never seen what an Adventist bishop looks like, here is a picture of one. I want to reassure you that I don't wear this outfit very often. I think the last time was about 15 or 16 years ago when my children, when my son and daughter graduated. But this is the outfit I received over there at the Gregoriana. In closing... Fellow believers and friends, I want to express my gratitude to God for two major reasons. First of all, for His providential leading in my life. And I hope you feel like me tonight. I was thanking God for His leading in your life. Because you know what? Each one of us has a story to tell. Isn't it true? We all have a story to tell of how the Lord has led us from darkness into His marvelous light. Some time ago, I was there in New York, invited by a Catholic bishop who joined our church. He invited me as the guest of honor at his baptism because uh, my research, he said, had been instrumental in helping him uh, to accept the Sabbath and join our church. In the last two years, I have had over 200 clergymen that have accepted the Sabbath after reading this research. And so I said to this bishop, Giuseppe, from Italy, Bishop of Brooklyn Diocese, said, Giuseppe, I was in the pastor study during Sabbath school for one hour, said, Giuseppe, tell me the story of God's leading in your life. It was gripping to hear his story. I wish I could share it to you. If I get time, I'll do it tomorrow afternoon. I see with this taping, I have to be sure that I, will, I keep an eye on the clock, otherwise I'm going to be cut off before my conclusion. But for me, it's a joy to listen to the story of God's leading in my life. And tonight, with you, I want to thank God for His leading in my life, for bringing this beautiful message to my mom and dad in Rome, living under the shadow of the Vatican. A message that has given me reason for living, for loving, for serving the Lord. I want to thank God for opening the door for me to aim to study research inside the Vatican. And while I was there, I want to thank God for leading me to a fuller and deeper understanding of the Sabbath. I have to confess to you tonight that when I went to study there, my understanding of the Sabbath was somewhat negative, even though I had studied four years in Adventist Academy in Florence, four years in Adventist College in England at Newbold, four years at our Adventist Seminary at Andrews, 12 years altogether. I have prepared no less than 20 term papers and research projects on the Sabbath. So I had really, you know, investigated the Sabbath. But somehow my understanding of the Sabbath was still rather negative. 
I saw the Sabbath primarily as a commandment, an obligation, something that we had to observe in order to be saved. But while I was there examining all those ancient documents of God's people, it dawned upon me for the first time that for God's people in ancient times, the Sabbath was not an obligation, it was not an imposition, but was a divine invitation. A divine invitation extended to us each week to make ourselves free and available for Him. An invitation extended to us to stop our work so that He can work in us more fully and more freely. Indeed, this is my fervent hope and prayer for each one of us tonight, that the Sabbath may become for us not a day of frustration, not a day of, what shall I say, imposition, not a day of gloom, but a day of gladness, a divine invitation extended to us each week to make ourselves free and available for God so that on this day we can experience the awareness of the presence of the peace and of the rest of Christ in our lives. This is indeed my prayer, my wish for each one of us tonight. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? O loving God and Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of the Sabbath, this day on which and through which we can meet with thee, in which we can experience the awareness of thy presence, of thy peace, of thy rest in our lives. I will pray tonight that each one, each one of us here might come to understand the Sabbath more fully, may come to experience the Sabbath more fully. May the Sabbath truly become for us not a day of frustration, but a day of joyful celebration of thy creative and redemptive love. May the Sabbath truly become for us the day when we stop our work to allow thee, O God, to work in us more fully and more freely. May the Sabbath become for us the day when we are able to cultivate the awareness of thy presence, of thy peace, and of thy rest in our lives. This is our prayer tonight. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh.